Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer and we try our best to understand what they're talking about. I'm Professor Matt Brown and with me is Dr. Chris Kavanagh um, and sometimes uh, we have um, a great mind to help us understand the other great minds and uh, that's the case today isn't it Chris? It is yes so we've invited on Matthew Ramsky, who maybe some of you know from the Conspirituality podcast. Um, he's done quite a lot of other things that we'll get into as well. But uh, I came across Matthew relatively recently and I've started working my way through the back catalog and Conspirituality uh, is looking at the overlap between the kind of spirituality and health and wellness communities and the growth in conspiratorial thinking and cult dynamics. And Matthew is also a journalist and researcher, investigative journalist. Would it be I, fair I'd to say, say Matthew? I'd say that's fair, yes. In, independent. Independent. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and not degreed. <laughs> <laughs> that's well but, sometimes that's better but the uh i when i was looking at your uh at your website you know to get uh, information about your background i saw that you'd you'd published a lot <laughs> on a yeah. like a broad range of topics so i i feel like i'm doing a disservice by you know just picking out on one thing but i will also say that it's relevant that you are a yoga teacher, right? And practitioner still, or yoga practitioner? I would say practitioner. I don't, I haven't, I haven't taught in a classroom except for uh, training groups where I will give like history and culture uh, content for mm. yoga teacher training programs. But I haven't taught like a, a lead yoga class in close to 10 years now. Uh, so mm. that's pretty firmly in my past. I, I still practice at home. But I do a lot of, you know, sort of independent study and research into recent yoga history and, and the sort of cultural scene. So, so yeah. That's, yeah, that's interesting because I, uh, when in listening to Conspirituality, the, the kind of impression that I got that was all of the hosts are, yeah. to an extent, they're within the communities that they're that that you are talking about and that you know criticizing or highlighting issues with but it it feels i wouldn't say that you are all typical of those communities in any respect but you're you're speaking about it from the position of people who have a lot of experience and and a lot it, i think it's fair to say a lot of empathy for the people that are uh in the even in the kind of the cult dynamics or the negative kind of guru space that you yeah. discuss i i hope so i mean i think we all feel very empathetic for you know this subculture that we've spent a lot of time in and, and that we have you know friends and, and family in uh derek and julian my co-hosts i think are still actively teaching yoga classes in online uh format because of the pandemic uh, I don't know if either of them will wind up going back to studios. I don't know if there's going to be yoga studios uh, when everybody's vaccinated. It seems like the brick and mortar economy of the yoga industry is crumbling as we speak. Um, but uh, yeah, we're almost like, um, I, I sometimes I feel like I'm in the position of, of uh, Brit Hermes or something like that, you know, I, who was trained as a naturopathic doctor and, and uh, then, then became a, then became a whistleblower, although she's um, she she doesn't have much redemptive to say about uh, naturopathic medicine at all. Mm. Uh, whereas whereas I maintain like a very strong sympathy actually for people who become engaged for very good reasons often with with yoga and Buddhism and and you know the adjacent spiritualities. Yeah, yeah. And I and I and I and I got a lot out of it too. I got a lot out of it. That might reflect my current position in regards to anthropology huh. <laughs> as well. Right. Yeah, okay. The, uh, yeah. In that, no, not that they are uh, full of uh, cult dynamics and conspiracies, usually, but that, that I, I would say 
I have quite a lot of criticisms about social anthropology and the kind of standard anthropological approach, but I also see a lot of value in it and a lot of good uh, if you can cut through some of the things that I might critique. My my perspective, of course, but uh, I think my anthropological background is is useful and I hope I bring it into my work, but I also hope that I can uh, put aside some of the bad or, or worse habits that anthropologists tend to have, um, which maybe we'll get <laughs> into, but yeah. And Matt, you must feel the same way, you know, psychologists, the replication crisis, you're even worse than- No, uh... no, we're fine. <laughs> yeah. Nothing to see here. It's all good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but actually, um, you know, the the empirical psychological literature on um, complementary and alternative health is kind of interesting. When when they look at the beliefs and they attempt to measure the beliefs, um, one of the scales that I quite like makes a distinction between two two types. So I think one of them is called holistic health beliefs, and the other one's called alternative health beliefs. And it's it's the second which is um, the one that and you, you can actually read the items and see that they do. Um, include t forms of magical thinking um, and, and stuff that is related to um, un unhelpful or unhealthy things. Whereas the holistic health beliefs, it's there's it's there's nothing wrong. Like w w you can read those, and those capture another uh, aspect of of it, and they are you know they're, they're not wrong like they're not they're not they're not anti-science they're not anti um w w whatever um and uh, yeah so it, it's yeah, you can probably be glad to know um other matthew that that even psychologists when we study those uh, um, um beliefs we we do make that distinction as well right mm. so one as as this kind of random jumping around introduction may illustrate we are not professional interviewers which i'm sure you've gathered Matthew, in general but there there are a bunch of topics that i wanted to ask your opinion on and have and uh have a discussion about some of the insights that we might have and and your impression for coming with a greater familiarity with the kind of conspirituality sphere and part of the uh, part of the main motivation that I wanted to get your uh, feedback on was after Matt and me did the JP Sears episode where we, I'd actually came across JP Sears a long time before, back when, you know, the, the videos that he was originally well known for, the kind of poking fun at, uh, at, kind of alternative spirituality and in a in a friendly manner i would say like a knowing way but i we we tried to take a break from the more serious content by by covering him but because i was aware that he was also uh had previously been a life coach and was kind of active in those communities while critiquing them but we didn't fully anticipate i think just how far he not only was into the kind of COVID denialism and or COVID skepticism, I think, you know, two ways to say the same thing, but that he had also picked up a whole host of talking points and kind of political perspectives, which were really familiar with us because we'd been covering, you know, IDW folk and um, kind of, yeah, like Trump apologist people. And, and he slotted just, right in there with with all the same talking points kind of the same issues pre-election this was um and I, i've continued listening to him afterwards and he's you know continued down that road and um i wanted to get your opinion first on those overlaps that we observed and that you see in jp series i know you've covered them uh, as well quite extensively uh to what extent are they a new thing which is emerging in the alternative spirituality spheres or is that something that has you know a longer history has been there uh, and maybe people just weren't paying attention and uh, basically just to ask your impression of have there been dramatic changes or significant changes in the 
Trump era and with COVID um, it related to that. So that, that would be my kind of opening question to uh, ask for your enlightenment. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, my, my best answer would suggest that there's a historical stream that a lot of these influencers are drawing upon, but then there's particular contemporary conditions. Um, you know, historically, I think we see the braiding of conspiracism in every spiritual paranoia that makes use of something like the blood libel, which is then reinvigorated by, you know, QAnon, for example, uh, in which the Jews are out to destroy babies and also the nobility of honest work through banking and so on. It's very, very old. Uh, but in terms of more recent history, um, when I'm with yoga teacher training groups and I'm doing history segments, um, I always emphasize that the yoga and wellness and the spiritual ideas connected with them that they're training under are directly connected to, you know, European fascisms of the early 20th century, uh, in which in which the body um, becomes kind of fetishized as the the microcosm of the of the pure nation, which usually means you know the purely xenophobic nation, uh, and. So um, there are deep threads of, of, you know, conservatism, I would say even, even right-wingism and fascism within, uh, uh, within the history of wellness culture. Um, and in, when we get into the digital age, however, um, the, I would say that there's a pipeline between right-wing conspiracism to... Um, or between spirituality and right-wing conspiracism that's defined by the basic libertarianism of the mm. industries involved. So there's this basic, you know, principle of hyper-individualism at play where when, you know, JP Sears seems to be joking when he says, you've got to start, stop outsourcing your truth. Um, mm. It's a nonsensical statement, but he's, he's really encapsul encapsulating something important to his whole demographic, which is that, He's telling people that their intuition, their subjectivity, their gut feeling under his influence, of course, uh, is some sort of core reality principle. And that premise of sort of the triumph of the individual will drives the entire unregulated economy of wellness influencers. Uh, they can't evidence their claims, so they have to appeal to personal truths. Um, you, you will never hear them talk about the social determinants of health. Uh, their entire ideology um, can't accommodate the notion of medicine that is not simply a consumer choice. And that's why the vaccine, by the way, is such a, a flashpoint, I think one of the reasons anyway. So even you know, if they view themselves as, as uh, socially progressive, you know, they're sex positive, they want to decriminalize drugs, they go to Burning Man, or whatever, um, at the root, there's this libertarian bias that's baked into their economy. And so their politics mm -hmm. are going to track towards the right. And what really that means is that um, they want less governmental interference, and that's going to sort of dictate their, their COVID views. You know, and just to return to the vaccine for a moment, it's a flashpoint because the vaccine is a very concrete, at least as far as I can tell, it's a very concrete um, presentation of social medicine. You like you 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 have to as an individual be like you have to be um, confronted by the needle point of the state, <laughs> uh, but you do it essentially for other people. Um, you do it not because it's not. But JP comes from a world of supplements, right? Where mm. where you have the choice to improve your immunity by taking this BS supplement, and so that's the model of sort of privatized healthcare that that is is essential to them. So, yeah, there are there are there are a number of 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 streams. I haven't actually seen enough stability in so-called progressive aspects of yoga and wellness culture to overcome uh, what we're talking mm -hmm. about either. That that accords with kind of things that you thought you had before, Matt, about the 
connections between libertarian and kind of focus on personal autonomy, right? The, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the the way you you expressed it there, Matthew, is um, really great, and I, I'm clearer, I think, than we've ever managed to express it. Even <laughs> yeah. though, even though um, we've had a lot of, uh, we're talking about a lot of the same ideas, where you have those 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 two aspects um, that you explained, which is that. Uh, on one hand, you have that valuing naturalness and purity, um, which is is that basis of a certain kind of spirituality, um, with obviously very positive sides to it, but there's actually also uh, a darker side to that as well. And and that second aspect, which is that strong preference for for um, 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 individual determinism uh especially around around your um, things existential things like like your health and a strong bias against commutarian type uh mm. things so as you said um vaccination is a flashpoint because it violates both of those two principles um, at the same and, time right yeah mm, mm. yeah 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 there's also something about there's also something about it is so sort of um immediately uh, representative of outside authority entering the body. And of course, that's, that gets conflated mm -hmm. with, uh, in the anti-lockdown rhetoric, it gets conflated with, uh, you know, rape culture discourse and, and, and Me Too discourse yeah. and stuff like that. Like, don't enter my body without my consent. Um, but, but because it enters the body... And it and it um, kind of reprograms in a way, which is another bit of rhetoric that they'll use. Uh, I think it replaces the idea of internal transformation very precisely. Right? It's mm. like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go through a personal epiphany in order to become more enlightened, and that's going to come from within me. But the vaccine is kind of like in their view the toxic mimic of that it's going to enter your body to transform your reality and that's why they're fixated on dna and shit like that because you know mm -hmm. it's like they, they, they're what they're saying is the vaccine is going to change my soul and i think what they're talking about is that it's going to change the ability of my soul to have autonomy mm, yeah that's so the thing that kind of surprised me and, and I, I think J the JP series episode was was part of an entry into this for myself because afterwards I've I've found many more examples but yeah. I I would say I was initially surprised uh because like like you kind of hinted that you know the and and you've mentioned on uh conspirituality many many times there's a there's a long-term association with uh like alternative health movements and like counterculture, left-wing counterculture movements, and and a kind of progressive attitude towards, like you say, things like sex or or drug use or psychedelics, right? And the part of the interest to me is that, uh, so you mentioned that those factors haven't been stable enough, right, to to overcome the the this other trend, but. I'm wondering with, you know, the there does seem to be a pretty strong movement on the left on the kind of social justice and progressive side of things. Uh, what, whatever stance that you take on, on those issues, it feels like they have, with the Me Too movement and, and with, you know, everything that has progressed since then in the past couple of years, that, that there is a clear strain of progressivism and maybe i i don't know her well so you can correct me on this but marianne williamson the the presidential candidate in the last yeah. cycle seems to me to embody that that image maybe a bit more and maybe the group i i know that group also has the kind of hyper capitalist aspect to it but but it also feels like it's 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 leaning a bit more towards the uh at least progressive identity and, and so i i i'm basically just wondering uh though you you feel that 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 sphere that element it hasn't really had a strong purchase in the communities it has um but it has not been um 
it's 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 been it's been polarizing more than anything else and i think um what we have in yoga and wellness is a very strong demographic uh, that might we might associate with uh, social justice activism that centers around um, the Me Too discourse, but then also Black Lives Matter and aware and an awareness of the you know structural inequalities that are embedded within boutique wellness services and the fact that you know very few people can actually access them. Uh, yeah. the, the the whiteness of urban yoga studios in the in the global north. Uh, there's a strong contingent of um, you know POC and especially WOC practitioners and teachers who are actively challenging the way in which yoga and wellness are configured in general. Now their ability to impact the mainstream. I think has started to happen in the sense that, you know, some, um, uh, you know, folks like Susanna Barkataki will come forward and be, they'll be, um, uh, they'll be uh, featured on the cover. I don't think she was on the cover, but she'll be featured prominently in Yoga Journal along with other um, teachers within the uh, NRI Indian diaspora. Um, and they provide really cogent, political critiques of the the inherent libertarianism of yoga and wellness. But as that has happened, uh, a kind of hardening of yoga libertarianism, I think, has also been evident. Uh, and in fact, I would say that uh, a test point for that is looking at J.P. Sears's career and seeing the point at which his... Um, you know, kind of good-natured picking on vegans begins to have a hardened, more hardened political edge to it. Mm. I think that's probably a good measurement for how he's responding to the reality of social justice language gaining more prominence within yoga and wellness spheres, actually. Uh, he's kind of like a barometer in that way. So, mm. um, but like, I don't the thing the thing about the the thing that I find problematic about um, social justice efforts within yoga and wellness is that if they appeal to you know sort of traditional yoga I don't know cultures and communities and texts there's often a lot of um, idealization that has mm. to be sort of uh, taken on in order to, you know, pretend as though medieval yoga cultures were inclusive or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, you know, the, the history and the authenticity and the traditionality of things like yoga and Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine are hotly contested. And from the right, they are used to uh, create this impression that, you know, somehow nothing should ever change and men are men and women are women and God is God and, you know, we're going to do our practice. And then from the left, uh, there's this vision of a more matrilineal set of practices that, you know, have always been about social liberation and equality. And I, you know, and it's like if you actually talk to people who research the sense they don't really find any of that stuff uh, yeah. on either yeah. side, and so and so the politicization of of the content itself is is um, uh, is is quite a sport, actually. Uh, I, I don't mean to use the word sport; it's 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 deadly serious, but it's it's very active. That's a. It reminds me of Rutger Bregman referring to hunter-gatherer societies as proto-feminist, <laughs> like really proto. <laughs> if you look at the, right. you know, the the levels of kind of domestic violence and you know, uh, kind of forced marriages and so on. It, yeah, that it, not across all hunter-gatherer societies, of course, but it's right. it would be a severe overstatement, I think, to pre present them as. Uh, strongly feminist uh, cultures as a whole, and uh, and this is and, isn't this where isn't this where like galaxy brain comes in because when we have when we have people who are willing to make claims like that, it's it's like they're they have some they usually they have some sort of immediate claim or observation that they want to make, and then they want to like 
infer outwards and backwards into history about how something must have been. And that seems to be one of the characteristics that you're describing in, in the, in the, in the gurometer uh, parameters, right. Is, mm. is just this willingness to, to just basically say anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they definitely do um, uh, exercise no restraint in terms of um, um, running a mark across any discipline, but, you know, um, history and, you know, um, including prehistory, anthropology is, um, is certainly one right. of the ones that, that they'll be rife with it. So, um, we, we, we just covered, uh, uh, um, I was going to say Gad Sad because he's been on my mind recently, but not <laughs> Gad Sad, tell him. Although Taleb. they are friends. Are they? they I'm they not surprised. I'm not surprised. And uh, he certainly does look back back to uh, um, traditional um, uh, social organizations as, as an inspiration. Ancient China, Greek and... The, uh, Ancient wisdom, Yeah. They, the which, thing that which just so happens tends to support and agree exactly what he's arguing surprising for. <laughs> surprising that yes there's a because it, it struck me as a like it's a difference that i you know because matt and i are academics and i like that come when i was talking about hunter galleries though right my urge is the caveat the statement not all hunter galleries right there's, right right there's exceptions of that but I see the exact opposite right. instinct in the guru sphere where people are very, very comfortable to suggest a kind of totalizing narrative across like entire cultures, millennia, and without being experts in the area. And even in the areas where I feel pretty solid about my knowledge, I often feel the need to, you know, caveat the claim to say, well, yes, of course, there's exceptions that you could raise to that point. but uh, I, I think Matt and I have both noticed that, you know, that is that makes you sound maybe less authoritative. In oh, some absolutely. Sense. It doesn't in an academic setting, but in a you know, in giving a lecture when you in when you show those kind of doubts and stuff, I I think for some people that's presented as well. He didn't, you know, that you're you're kind of you don't have the confidence to just like go out. And that's why I know that you I listened to you discuss Jordan Peterson. Oh, and, man. Yeah. And I know you have very strong opinions with him, <laughs> in part because I want to hear these. The fact, <laughs> it's very, uh, they were great because the thing I really appreciated about it um, was that, you know, you know him because he's in, a, a, you know, a Toronto academic. And right. so you are aware of the political aspects which which often get overlooked in the way he presents himself but that way of talking that with like complete confidence and and even where you add in caveats and disclaimers that they're just you know kind of throwaway points i i think he is a really prototypical example of that kind of person um yeah you can do that well yeah and and he um the the caveat itself is a way of um tamping down the effect of one's the possible effect of one's charisma and and the influencer culture is going to work exactly the opposite uh way is that is that the caveat actually is going to um put a, some sort of like distance or veil over the radiance of the person's confidence uh and that's just it just won't do like your caveat is it, jp sears would tell you directly you're outsourcing your truth because the only way that the only reason that you'd put the caveat on is to satisfy the external critic who might know more than you in that particular area or who might have an, a, a valid opposing opinion. And, you know, so you don't want to like commit over commit to, to, you know, going into somebody else's territory or making a fool of yourself. But like in influencer culture, that's just not a thing. It's like <laughs> the, the, you have to make a virtue of making a fool of yourself mm. because there's nobody around you in the room who's going to tell you otherwise, right? That's, I mean, that's, yeah. Th this is the really interesting thing, Matthew. I mean, maybe you can say a bit more on this because I, I've heard you talk, I believe, about this kind of idea where there's a real, it, it gets into epistemology, this um, internal um, source of, of, of truth and, yeah. um, and, and a real trust and belief in the ineffable, um, which... Uh, as opposed to the external and the objective. And it, it, that feels just really central to what's going on. Yeah, and I think it's a misprision of um, some very beautiful old literature. You know, I, I think of how 
this refrain in the Upanishads uh, between in these conversations between usually fathers and sons or older men and younger men uh, about what the nature of the universe is. And the, the answer is always mystical and aphoristic and kind of um, uh, ineffable, right? Where, where the, the, the son will say, so, you know, what is this self? And the father will say, well, you know, the self is like the, the, the ghee and milk, or it's like the salt in, you know, in the ocean water, or, uh, and then, and then the, the ending of the statement will be that very self is you. Uh, and so it's like the, the, the philosophical lesson, the ancient philosophical lesson, lesson, which is about, as far as I can tell, the, the inexpressibility of, you know, existence and and the failures of language and the the inability that that people seem to share of being able to really find anything to hold on to uh so they so they decide out of an act of faith to sort of focus in on an experience and say well that's my ground of being uh i think what happens in popular culture is that is that they they take that second person you know uh, that very self is you, and they think it's me. <laughs> they think it's like like JP Sears read it, read that, and they said, "Oh, it's me." Okay, <laughs> like, like no, that's that's exactly opposite of what the old book said. I think, unless I'm idealizing too, but I, you know, I just refuse to believe that you know uh, this this literature stayed around for so long so that it could validate you know uh, grandiose people. It's just I don't think that's what it was for. The interesting thing that struck me with the description there, and I haven't necessarily connected the two clearly together, is we've we've talked about a lot of gurus who um, have a way with metaphors. Dan Gilbert, oh, the yeah. member of Eric Weinstein's community, was was saying that Eric has a remarkable gift to kind of remember metaphors and to he's always putting out kind of new ones. And it never struck me until you just said there, uh, Matthew, that the, the the classical religious texts or spiritual texts, which are rife with these kind of quite quite beautiful, quite striking metaphorical descriptions. You know, the uh, enlightenment is like the sun piercing f or the coming out from behind the clouds, and uh, or polishing the mirror, and and all of the various analogies and metaphors that you get in that literature it, it might be this might be kind of stroking the ego ego of the gurus that we look at but it, it strikes me that maybe that's a modern version and, and it, it might be a hollow version of it but i think there is a similar aspect to it in the poetic use of language and metaphor that that in itself is a way that adds profundity to you know matt and i are often kind of pointing out that that actually what underlies that in many of the cases in the gurus that we're looking at is very mundane insights that it didn't require a 20 minute metaphor to right disentangle but but yeah i i think there's there's an element of continue uh, a continuum there uh between that facility for metaphor uh in in gurus who have something valuable to say and people who maybe don't um but right. but can command the same attention you know you know as as you're speaking i'm i'm thinking about how uh maybe it's the the haiku and the whole genre of of end poetry that would be antidotal to this because because the 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 uh, the observations are so naturalistic but also banal you know uh, that that Basho is talking about the frog in the forest pond, and and I don't think Eric Weinstein would quote that, right? Like, that's well, he the... he might if he pointed oh. out that it was a Zen koan or oh, I see, okay, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. If, right. He, if he oh, oh the... and if he did, or maybe if he did a hipster interpretation of it, that that uh, that, yeah, that if there well... was an exegesis that said that that oh the you know the frog symbolizes this or that or yeah maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah this coin is not what you think it is. That's that's the important <laughs> thing. Uh, right. They, they've all been getting it wrong. But right. the, the, and another point before I forget, and I, I know you mentioned it quite a while ago, but it, 
it's it's a it's actually the another point that I wanted to get to with you was that my I think I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast or not, but there's there's a tradition in anthropology looking at uh, this literature that talks about invented traditions. Have you ever come across that before, Matt? That's not. Yeah. So Hobsbawm and Ranger, I think, are the two who and were initially associated with it, and it was basically looking at elements of culture and showing how these cultures, which are often presented as kind of timeless or with deep historic and ancient roots, are often recent inventions or or at least have substantial elements of them that are are kind of manufactured within a much you know more contemporary period and the examples include things like uh highland kilt wearing and uh and i'm familiar with some of the ones that are looking at uh japanese culture so that would include you know the the dogi the white training uniform which associated with martial arts but which was kind of co-opted by kano the the founder of judo and was he was using it actually as a kind of uh he tried to introduce to japanese martial arts a modern scientific mindset not a kind of traditional he wanted it to be an olympic sport which he succeeded in and so on but so this image of like kind of ancient traditions where you know it's layered on top but it can but it can actually be very recent and i know matthew from some of the things I've heard you talk about in conspirituality, and I think you've done some investigations as well into yeah. the uh, that that very thing in yoga communities uh, or um, or maybe other areas as well. So I was interested to hear your thoughts on that, and also to some extent uh, your reflection about after you reveal that. So say you can document that a. Uh, a tradition isn't old, right? That it's, I mean, th that it's primarily being invented by, say, a Westerner 60 or 70 years ago, and they, they were not relying on these ancient traditions from the Far East, or if they were, they were, you know, drawing a lot of inspiration from themselves. And uh, in those cases, how how is that received? And do you think it actually... Uh, that that it has an impact on the you know the communities when when these kind of things are found out or yeah uh, it, i know that's a whole bunch of questions but you can t pick and choose what you'd like the answer yeah they're great questions um and you know i would say that the whole field that i study when i'm sticking with yoga is just littered with invention that poses as as traditionality and usually what this allows <clears throat> is for charismatic leaders uh, to both, you know, claim market share through, you know, this is the real thing that I have. Uh, it also allows allows them to clothe their excesses in the mystique of the past. You know, you can't understand what I'm doing because it comes from another time and place. It also is used to cover over or rationalize abuses. Um, and on the positive side, it also gives people a sense, especially if they're, you know, disconnected in their sort of postmodern alienation, it gives them a sense of depth and sort of historical grounding. But I think it's really, you know, it's a negative thing when that's deceptive. Uh, so I got some examples. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I wrote a I wrote a book about um, Patabi Joyce, the founder of Ashtanga Yoga, and I showed that he sexually assaulted his students for decades uh, from about the 80s till he died. Uh, and people rationalized it because uh, he gave them the impression that the physical adjustments that he was giving to them were traditional. Uh, there's no such thing. Uh, we, they don't, you know, the notion that yoga teachers are touching the bodies of students doesn't emerge until the 1930s. And that happens uh, in the classroom of another main kind of mythological figure. Uh, I mean, he's a real figure, but there's a mythos around him. So, um, 
the person who is widely acknowledged to be the founder of modern yoga, uh, Tirumalai Krishnamacharya, was Patabi Joyce's uh, teacher. And he claimed that he learned his discipline from some mystical yogi that nobody else had heard of uh, named uh, Rama Mohan Brahmachari, who either lived in South India or in Nepal, depending on who Krishnamacharya was telling the story to. Uh, but he said that Brahmachari was 200 years old and that's just sort of accepted amongst, uh, you know, the majority of people who are devoted to modern yoga as a spirituality. But it's also used to cover over the fact that a lot of modern yoga uh, is profoundly influenced, if not like directly mimicking European physical culture of the early 20th century. Um, in another segment, if listeners have uh, heard of Yogi Bhajan and Kundalini Yoga or 3HO, this guy hung his entire credibility on something he called the golden chain of teachers that uh, he claimed would go back to the Stone Age. But in actuality, he contrived virtually all of his content in the 1970s. Um, <laughs> You know, my the 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 one of the cults I was in was led by a guy named uh, Michael Roach, uh, who ostensibly taught Tibetan Buddhism, uh, but and he had some competence in in Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, but but only really enough to convince people that the prosperity gospel stuff that he really wanted to sell was traditional. Um, mm. But this last part of your question, like, like what happens when people find out uh, when when the when the veil is torn away? Um, in 2010, uh, a yoga scholar named Mark Singleton published a book called Yoga Body. Uh, I think it's called A History of Modern Yoga. I can't remember the subtitle, but it was kind of a watershed moment for this global industry that you know is worth $40 billion or something and is riding on these claims of, of ancientness uh, because he did the, you know, he did the, the, the research and the legwork to show that, you know, you really can't separate modern global yoga that takes place in a classroom from, you know, European calisthenics and, you know, gymnastics training and, uh, you know, public education in, in, you know, in, in uh, colonial India. And um, that really tore at least my, my little part of the yoga world apart because on, on one hand, this campaign was uh, raised against Mark to, uh, you know, really erroneously try to debunk all of his painstaking evidence. Uh, and to suggest that he was doing it because he hated Hindus uh, and that, um, you know, so there was a Hindu nationalist sort of faction that came in and tried to erase this scholarship uh, and to cancel Mark, really. Uh, and, then, and then there were other people who were like, wow, we knew something was funny. We knew something was up with this. <laughs> we knew this wasn't. We 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 knew that that uh, the, the, what we were told for the last thirty or forty years didn't quite add up. And you know maybe the relationship between you know uh, European physical culture and colonial public schooling and world punishment and all of this physical abuse in yoga classes maybe that's a thing to tie together and. Uh, uh, and it gave people a lot of sort of uh, freedom to, it gave some people the freedom to say, oh, you know, whatever yoga is, it's like an ongoing, um, you know, participatory art form and culture. And, you know, let's just be honest about the fact that we're changing it as we do it, whatever it is. Mm, that's, a, um, my, I, I'm interested to hear what you think about this because a lot of this is, you know, it, it, the 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 specifics that you're talking about, Matthew, are new to me, but a yeah. lot of it is very familiar. And like we were talking about before we started recording, I I started out my academic career studying Tibetan and and focusing on study of religions, and and that was partly because of a personal interest in Buddhism as a practice. But right. what going to university and studying the history of Buddhism and Buddhism in other uh, cultures, the, the kind of actual culture uh, from an anthropological perspective, it, it kind of revealed that my personal 
image was founded on, you know, exoticism and an inaccurate image that had kind of been deliberately sold to the uh, sold and marketed to a Western audience. And right. I'm not even blaming the people who did that because in a large respect, they were responding to colonialism and trying to absolutely. You know, so there's legitimate elements to it. But I, one of the stories that I always remember was there's a book, you might've heard of it, Mark, called The Third Eye, um, uh, autobiography of a Tibetan Lama. It was like popular in the 50s and 60s, but it's it's part of where the concept, you know, of the third eye enters the popular culture in the West. And it was supposed to be written by a Tibetan Lama, Lobsang Rampa, but there was an investigation into it and it turned out to be uh, Cyril Henry Hoskin, who was the son of a plumber and, and had, you know, no, no connections to Tibet or any of that. And it was like, it was all, you know, basically just his imagination. And he turned out to be this eccentric guy that would like walk a cat on the lead and all these uh, strange things. But when, when you start looking into those, um, that, that, the kind of history or, or even of frauds and, or invented traditions, it's often very fascinating what actually happened, like yeah. how, how people were why they were presenting traditions in certain ways or, or, or way why for example we've inherited the view that buddhism is a philosophy and not a religion right there's a, right, there's a right. reason for that um but but yeah uh, so this this is music to my ears but i'm i'm wondering my for for you coming at it from the more psychological background does any of this seem surprising or is this kind of all of the foibles that you expect when dealing with uh, imperfect people? <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess what you're talking about is mainly sociological and historical and so on. So it's kind of outside of psychology a little bit. But what I was thinking of, of is how that relates to the naturalness fallacy. So, so we talked about that with respect to Nassim Taleb because he was leaning on that pretty heavily in the same sort of vein, which is that practices that are old and traditional and, um, you know, have persisted for hundreds of thousands of years are good. And when you think about it, that really is, I mean, it was you who described that as a, like a, just a particular ang type of, of naturalness fallacy. And um, it struck me, I was just thinking to myself, well, okay, yes, clearly um, these um, v various gurus of all kinds do like to um, get the credibility that's associated with venerable age. And um, I, I guess I see it as an instantiation of the naturalness fallacy. Does that, does that sound plausible to you guys? It does in the sense that there's, there's, I mean, it feels as though traditional as a term, as a category is almost like synonymous with the pure or the natural or the untrammeled, or it's not been, it's not been infected by modernity or by the scientific method or by, uh, you know, materialism or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be a very close overlap between those two things and they're like felt, they're felt things. So when people say the word tradition, in the yoga world you can almost see them stand up straighter or something like that it's like it's in their it's in their bodies yeah um, and look and i think that's an i mean it's a natural thing dare i say i mean like my you know my kids <laughs> uh, my family all, all does karate and it's nice you know that the fact that there is a history to it yeah that it's i like irish like, dancing yeah you like irish dancing <laughs> like the fact that it wasn't made up by bruce down the road right <laughs> is, right is you know there's nothing wrong i think with, with with like you know but we should acknowledge that you know humans do have we 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 like that we like traditional stuff intuitively and i also would, would just like to i have i have a little story from yoga history that i think points out that that disillusionment is cyclical and then and then some people seem to go into periods or phases of sort of like reconstituting the authentic or the traditional. And I'm thinking about, uh, there was an early, um, you know, uh, early anti-colonialist uh, activist who ended up, I think, becoming prominent in the RSS in, um, in, in India in the late 19th century. His name What's was- What's the uh, RSS? 
uh, the I forget the acronym, but it ends up being the sort of um, uh, it ends up it ends up being the sort of uh, pedagogical and moral wing of the BJP in modern India. It provides the sort of like historical backdrop for Hindutva politics, for okay. Hindu nationalist politics. Uh, and all of it. it's like it's it's like an ancient it's like a very old think tank and uh, sort of cultural activist movement for Hindutva politics, and uh, so this this guy uh, uh, Dayananda, um, this is the late nineteenth century. There's a story about him uh, about how he goes on one of these journeys throughout the country to figure out what is actually India and what does it all have in common as part of this project of trying to re-envision a post-colonial uh, you know, state. And he travels on this pilgrimage with a number of medieval yoga texts so goes the story and you know they teach about internal anatomy and the chakras and the and the channels and all of this stuff uh and he describes how they never really made sense to him uh and so one day he happens upon a corpse in a river uh, and he decides he's going to just wade into the river, take out the corpse and dissect it to see whether or not these old books are telling the truth. Uh, and then he finds out that they're not, that that when he, you know, eviscerates this body, uh, that, you know, he doesn't find the channels and the chakras and, you know, the, the organs are in different places from how they're drawn in these medieval texts. Uh, and And at this moment, there's this heartbreaking... Uh, description of him throwing all of those books into the river and saying that, okay, well, the only thing, therefore, that will be true for the spirituality of yoga that I want to make as a part of my, you know, as part of my politics, really, or to support my politics is going to be Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the Veda, um, or I, I would say probably the late Vedic literature. I'm not quite sure what he was referring to, but he basically threw out all all of the pre-modern medical and folk medicine stuff at that moment in this sort of, um, you know, spasm of disillusionment and sort of recollected what he felt would be rational and supportable for his vision of yoga and specifically Hindu yoga. Uh, and it's just really, it's kind of amazing because, because uh, he's finding out something about, about his traditional texts at that moment. He's going through a process of throwing things away that don't seem to, to work, but then he's also sort of bestowing a blessing and relevance upon what he thinks is going to work going forward. Uh, and so it's, it's not like this is a new story either. Like people are getting disillusioned all the time and then they, and then they sort of recongregate around things that they want to be very, um, that they want to be true or they think will be useful for them going forward. Yeah, that, that when I was looking at the history of, uh, I focused on Buddhism and East Asia in particular, and that dynamic where, you know, it, it's common in all religious and various cultural movements that there's periods of uh, kind of fundamentalism or alternatively uh, intersect, you know, battles for who is the, which is the authentic group. And it often involves that, you know, people have the image of like uh, these kind of ancient times with philosophers having, you know, philosophical battles about the details of the <laughs> right, right. dharma. And, right. and sometimes, sometimes, yes, but a lot of times it's polemical. Like you right. see the content and they're disparaging the characters of the monks who practice the other thing and, you know, saying those idiots and or, right. or they're seeking patronage from some prince in order to like instantiate their communities and kick out the other ones. And it, that was part of the thing that was, you know, interesting to me was that all those, the kind of romanticized version of history is much less interesting than the actual version of history. But, right. but, but that also just as a side on a point that you mentioned was, uh, I mean, one of the Matthews <laughs> mentioned was that, you know, this, uh, kind of appealing back to the image or like the, these kind of ancient traditions, right? Like Taleb, Matt, that you were saying. But uh, I don't know if you've noticed, Matthew, but J.P. Sears, like, you know, lots of these 
guru figures, they have go to pop culture or movies that they reference. And right. the one that I've heard him reference multiple, multiple times is Braveheart. And oh. it's, he, <laughs> he, but he mentions it as if it was a historical, you know, that yes, there was a Willie Wallace, but he was not the way that he was portrayed in that wasn't movie, Mel. but yeah, but <laughs> right. for JP Sears, it, it really feels the way he talks about it. Like that, that movie is what actually happened, you know? And so he, he talks about, he wants to be like William Wallace and, you know, and yell out freedom as he's being disemboweled and, and I'm listening, but going, but you know, that was the movie, right? <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, it's interesting that there's this kind of overlap with the fictionalized and romanticized past, but it it's still used as like powerful illustrations. And in some sense, it almost doesn't matter as long as it has the motifs that they want to emphasize. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many stories from the history of uh, modern yoga where um, the male uh, evangelists end up going through these archetypal journeys. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of them that lose their fathers when they're nine years old. There's a bunch of them that have mystical visions when they're 16. Uh, and, you know, these are all self-reported, uh, but then they're self-reported uncritically to the point where uh, they're, they're, they become repeated as though somehow there had been historical research into, into these people, rather than uh, the anecdote that the person told about themselves has kind of become this movie that everybody now can reference uh, and, and that, has, that has extraordinary power. Yeah, it's amazing actually how it happens and quite beautiful in, in some ways. It's just, you know, it's just so irritating when, when um, you know, when, when folks are not able to take the extra step and say, oh, look at all of the ways in which we're able to sort of like convince ourselves of something. That's kind of awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, that's it. Well, there, so there's, I, I'm looking at my list of questions. There's, there's a bunch of things and I know I don't want to take up all your time. So I'll try to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Uh, <clears throat> to hit some of the, the points. So, um, one of the, uh, questions I had came from the discussion we had with Teen Nguyen, the philosopher um, who, who has looked at conspiracy theories and uh, e echo chambers and what's the other one, Matt? Echo chambers and filter bubbles. Uh, uh, yep. Is that right? on, online incentives. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, and gamification. Bubbles. He has oh. many things. He's got echo, his fingers e in echo, many pies. Echo bubbles. Echo bubbles. Echo I think bubbles. <laughs> but with one question he had for us um which and it, it was quite a productive area that we discussed was whether the dynamics of modern social media were creating changes to the kind of classical guru structure and he suggested that maybe he had observed that there was more flattery and kind of less harsh criticism and kind of the the negatively violenced side of things but when me and matt were discussing that we had observed in the kind of within guru communities that those like in the discords or in the Facebook groups, that those kind of more negative aspects and policing of followers were, were still common, but maybe not evident, you know, so obvious on Twitter or that kind of thing. But I'm wondering from your work, um, and since you're active in both these kind of spheres, like the traditional cults and their their modern versions and the online uh, online instantiations how how do you feel have things changed dramatically in the digital age or or is it old wine and new bottles i think that that uh, observation that there's more authority and less um overt authoritarianism up front is very uh key and i haven't actually thought about that but i think it's it's very true and that I think is reflective of the uh, sort of charismatic romance of influencer culture where the basic aesthetic is the selfie video with intrusive eye contact and really beautiful framing and you know, welcome into my world. It's kind of, there are a lot of 
leaders who are doing kind of um, love letters to their to their potential recruits all, all the time. So so I'll, I'll yeah I'll think more about that. But I think that's really uh, observant. I think the first thing to say is that um, <clears throat> most of the cult theory that 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 we have is pre digital. Um, and I feel like most researchers are swimming pretty frantically upstream as the cult landscape has changed very, very quickly um, away from, away from um, in-person uh, dynamics and into the weird space that is you know, online dynamics. Uh, in the digital world, all of the, the, the cultic theory around bodily control kind of goes out the window because mm. you know you're not in a you're not in a place in which people can um in which leaders can dictate when you're when you're getting up or what you're eating exactly when or who or you know who you're having sex with or not having sex with or whether you're masturbating or not or you know um there's there's all kinds of avenues of bodily control that um, I think it's possible that leaders are learning how to outsource those controls to the tech platforms themselves. Uh, and then if they can, using you know, video elements, uh, as, I, as I suggested, to amplify things like intrusive eye contact. There's somebody that you can look up. Um, I don't think this is in your sort of guru remit. She's, she's more of a, a new age influencer and, and priest. Uh, but her name is Elizabeth April. And if you look up her, her YouTube videos, um, you just have to look for about 30 seconds at what she does in terms of the aesthetics to see that there's this like completely oversaturated, uh, absolutely like, um, like scintillating uh, HD quality to the to everything that she does and to the to the I mean the focus and the texture and her makeup and the it's just like overwhelming uh, she looks like she looks like a uh, like a supermodel, like leading you into a into a trance state, uh, and so I think that can that is one way in which just through aesthetics that people who who are beginning intentionally or not to create cultic dynamics are starting to utilize, um, you know. And then in terms of sound, uh, I think that uh, this might apply to Eric Weinstein if he were running a cult. I don't know if he is or not, but listening to him, holy shit, it's like an ASMR experience. Like mm. he's just all over that microphone. I don't know. I don't know how you guys like don't get pilled by him listening to him for four hours at a time because at or, times or, two like, speed it loses some of that richness <laughs> <laughs> right um but yeah it's it's really really hypnotic um i think for a lot of people um i think also the economics of online cultism is totally changing everything and turning it upside down on one hand monetization of the cultic dynamic is easier, but it's also less stable. So for instance, with somebody like uh, Bentinho Massaro, uh, who up until a couple of years ago ran like a super well attended or subscribed operation out of um, Boulder, I think, or Crestone, California. Good place for it. Uh, right, um, he, he, got, he got busted by, um, uh, B. Schofield, who's a colleague of mine and kind of like a, a guerrilla uh, journalist, um, gonzo, uh, anti-cult, uh, independent reporter. And uh, she published an article on her site called uh, Tech Bro Guru and kind of ran down his, his profile a little bit. Uh, and we don't actually know what that did to his uh, subscription model. But I had the sense at the time that, oh, like... People don't have to buy in at very high levels to 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 support him financially. They might be subscribed for twenty dollars a month or forty dollars a month or something like that. These are not these are not these are not leaders who are making bank by getting people to hand over all of their life savings, right? Mm. So the threshold for the threshold for entry is lower. I would say that the sunken costs are also going to be lower. And also the fact that you're getting your guru fix through the same screen that you could click 
click out of and get it from somebody else means that they're very transitive, right? It's like you could pick and choose uh, you know, you just have to open another tab and, and some other guy is there going, you staring into your eyes. And so um, I think what really super confounds uh, uh, cultic theory is QAnon because obviously the behaviors that people exhibit uh, are of full indoctrination and then co-recruitment, right? It's like the, and, and the indoctrination happens really fast. Like people who specialized in radicalization are amazed that folks can become full QAnon boosters and recruiters within a matter of days. Um, but there's no leader. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's an absent, there's a vacuum at the center of QAnon. Uh, you know, we, we know, we kind of, we, nobody's seen who they are. Uh, the drops themselves are very poetic and compelling to the people who buy off on them. But it's like we have a global cultic organization with no central organization and no discernible leadership. And then the leader hasn't even posted since December 8th now. And the people who are probably in control of it, uh, you know, Jim and Ron Watkins have kind of slowly distanced themselves from it. And so it's like, if you run that through the, the cultic models that, that, that came out of um, studying Jonestown or Heaven's Gate or, you know, or, or Scientology, they just don't compute, right? No. No. There's just so many different elements going on. I think my answer for the leaderless cult, my theory anyway, is that, you know, without a leader, what the cultic environment has to do is that it has to deputize everybody else as leaders or proto leaders, right? It's like, so everybody becomes a digital soldier mm. and, and the gamification of QAnon then becomes the fill in for the, the juice, the charismatic juice that, that the leader would have given if they were there, if they even existed. Well, can, can, can I ask you about that, Matthew? Because yeah. I mean, pr prior to QAnon, I mean, I was just thinking earlier today the, of QAnon as as an example of crowdsourced propaganda, which, yeah. uh, which is a similar kind of idea. But I, just as you were speaking, I, I was thinking of the Flat Earth Facebook groups and the uh, chemtrail, oh, right. the right. chemtrail wiring Facebook groups. So there are probably other examples too. And, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I get the feeling that they're similar in a way in that they're they're crowdsourcing their doctrine which is you know it's 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 a rich tapestry it's not it's not a, it's not like a um a, a, a rigid doctrine um yeah. it's, it, it 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 evolves depending on what stuff sticks and what stuff doesn't um yeah do, do, do you see connections with with other I, I do I just I'm just not so familiar with those spaces but I imagine that I imagine that that's that's very that's very true and it makes me actually realize that I sh I I would be remiss to neglect that there is one piece of new cult uh analysis that um that I'm aware of that changes the focus a little bit away from okay well is this really a pyramid with leadership and and you know lieutenants and a circle and does it follow the Hannah Arendt model of of you know sort of like widening circles of influence and you know propaganda that faces the outside and lies that face the inside and stuff like that um and and it's the it's the work of Alexandra Stein who's in the UK and what she did was was she said it's it's she didn't she doesn't say this specifically but her research implies that it's not the structure and the leadership that defines the cult it's the quality of the relationships in relation to um, the 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 interpersonal attachment stuff uh, and and she basically defines the cult as a cluster of disorganized attachments where. Uh, people are bound together through the oscillation of terror and love. And so you don't necessarily need a leader for that. You need a sort of relational culture in which people 
in a Facebook group are constantly terrorizing each other with the terrible thing that's going to happen. And then on the other hand, they're constantly pretending to love and care for each other. Uh, and that can create, you know, this kind of trauma bonded group experience that's very difficult to leave. And therefore it creates kind of a skin around it that we might identify as cultic. It's like you're in that and it's hard to go. Yeah. And, and, and it's hard to go, even if you know it's harmful to you. Right. Um, because it's become absorbing and, and you've lost other relationships. Yeah. There's, yeah that, that makes sense to me. Mm. Yeah. There's so, so many things, Matthew, you mentioned there that completely gelled with my impression that uh, I, I really encourage anyone that's listening to, to listen to your podcast and break down these topics. Cause there's, you, you have a, a whole, a, a really, lot of excellent insights and I, i'm i'm doing that idw thing of praising the, 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 <laughs> the person I, but i can't but i can't still resist. <laughs> I, yeah I, it's still true and i have to say as well that you, you know the focusing on voice i'm not sure matt and i have voices made for podcasting but you certainly <laughs> do so if you right. if you want to join the dark side you've got like the the right timber and the right you know elements right. with phrases we are screwed matt but yeah, the, we got no chance no. but the apart from that phone uh, can i just say something about that is that is that uh, the modern yoga world also is dominated uh, the top tier uh, earners are dominated by people with with theater and film training. This is a little known uh, secret. And so it really fits into the performativity of uh, of of the of the whole culture and this strange kind of like non-distinction that's made between are you appearing to be spiritual or are you spiritual? And so uh, and so, yeah, like I do have some, some, like my, some theater and, and voice training in my, in my background. And so I just can't help but to use that. But then, yeah, you're right. You pointed out and I'm like, oh boy. Well, <laughs> no, uh, it's, <laughs> like, yeah, it, it's a, it's a yeah. power that can be used for good or evil, but the, yeah. Uh, right. um, and I, I, the points that you were raising reminded me, you know, that I heard, I think it's your most recent episode where you're talking about pandemic, but focusing on it from the point of view about this intimate uh, kind of high production value confessional style that rather than, you know, which I think skeptical groups or, or maybe traditional skepticism might approach it more from the point of view of the content, right? Like yeah. what are they taught? What are the actual facts about the vaccines and so on? But I, I think that, misses the points that you're raising that a lot of it is in the presentation style and and the emotions that that are um that that brings up in people and, totally uh, and the the other thing that that struck me was when you were, were talking about you know this this ecosystem of gurus which now exists and on always did but maybe online there's more of it bumping together and of the ability, there's a bigger marketplace, right? Whereas before you might not have came across gurus that weren't in your local sphere. Now they're global and they're all right. available at the click of a button. And it made me think, Matt, you know, when we are looking at this content and we we keep constantly seeing, especially in the feed now, because the, the, the Coding the Gurus uh, uh, Twitter account only follows the people that we've covered. So it's right. a nightmare feed to, to <laughs> log into. But, but one of the things that you notice is that there's a lot of overlaps with people that you wouldn't like, uh, for example, uh, James Lindsay was retweeting JP Sears recently, or Scott Adams was being retweeted by Eric Einstein or Eric Einstein. He'd like that Eric Weinstein, but the, and you I actually you've made this point, Matt, that there's kind of this uh, dynamic where uh, the big swinging brains in the room are all kind of bumping along beside each other, but, but rubbing up against uh, each other as well. Yes. That was the analogy. And, uh, it's not so a very nice they, analogy. <laughs> yeah, but they need to flatter each other, but they're also in competition for the the hardest take and the kind of. I think there is an element of 
they have to constantly pro be providing the next big thing or you know the next big well, tick. I, I i bet that's true of spiritual people too am i right matthew Yes. Well, what I'd like to say is that what might not be apparent from uh, from an academic perspective is the uh, economies of influence uh, in unregulated industries at play. That, yeah, if your guys are quoting each other, it's not just that they are merging their email lists. It's also possible, very possible, that they share affiliate deals, uh, that, that, the, that the, the new age platforms that they use uh, will demand in some cases that if they're published by, if, if Sounds True is publishing JP Sears, they've cut him loose actually, but if they're publishing JP Sears and somebody else that are, and, and they're in that zone, uh, they are actually required cont contractually and then they're rewarded economically for promoting each other's material. Uh, and so this is a huge problem uh, actually in terms of the, the economic spread and, and uh, clout of unregulated industries is that they co-promote as they are in competition with each other as well. Um, the idea is that they're, they're, they're always creating new markets. We had a guest on, uh, Rebecca Baruki, uh, who talked about how as an author at Hay House, which is like a top new age uh, publisher in the United States, uh, founded by Louise Hay, uh, who used to tell gay people that they wouldn't get AIDS if they had a better attitude about themselves. Um, she, uh, <laughs> she, uh, and then uh, th that has set the stage, right, right, for like her sort of mind over matter, you know, heal yourself through good intentions stuff. Um, so uh, R Rebecca uh, Baruki started to say, okay, well, why, Hey House, are you, um, you know, are you publishing the work of Christiane Northrup, who is denying COVID, and this is impacting, you know, communities of color? And um, and and once we talked to her a little bit, we we realized that, and she told us this story about how uh, when she was brought in as a Hay House author, uh, the, the the huge emphasis on her on in her onboarding was here are the other authors that you need to connect with, get testimonials from, get, get book cover blurbs from. Um, I mean, I know that there's some of this kind of like back scratching and incestu incestuous stuff in academia, but I mean, I don't think the stakes are as high as they are <laughs> in, um, in, in, uh, in, in, in the new age world because uh, these people literally have nothing else. They don't have anything except each other to, to, to provide mutual validation. Um, mm. they can't actually submit their stuff for peer review. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so there's networking there. I would, I would, I would bet that, um, uh, the people who you've got, you know, in your, in your health feed are actually, um, they're actually economically benefiting from proximity. That's, a, I mean, we, we've talked a bit, Matt, about the, that what you've i think what you've talked about my fear is like unregulated markets that we've noted in an informal sense about the tendency to promote supplements across absolutely right across p figures that you wouldn't necessarily associate that that's related to their brand like eric weinstein right a kind of sciencey person you know if you take him at face value but is promoting lion's mane mushroom herbal tea or and right. the connection it doesn't seem apparent but we we actually included it as a kind of bonus point on the grammar to say right. uh, because we were noticing it so much so it's in i think some of the other connections at uh, it, it might be the simply the effect of not yet being a mature market in some space in the people that we are looking at um I, I you know it, it it calls to mind to me that the idw the intellectual dark web one of the it's morphed over times and it's you know it, it's changed its contours in a whole lot, lot of way but initially people were focusing on that that group essentially what would they would do on twitter is that they would you know promote something and then they would hashtag in or at all the other people in it and they were kind of cross promoting and attending right. events together. And I, that was seen as a, like, sort of like a new thing emerging, but it makes right. me think now that it, it's just basically piggybacking on 
these these tried and true practices that exist in the new age and spirituality sphere and like it's yeah that what like i didn't make that connection so clearly but that that's existed forever uh it, there it has we have economic pathways that have been forged by mlms by um by new age publishing houses and their lists and by alternative health companies uh, and those are those build relationships and marketing relationships through affiliation deals. Uh, and yeah, I mean, um, the the uh, because I follow the the influencers that we cover, I'll get emails from Kelly Brogan or Sayer G, and probably uh, a half or at least a third of the content in any given newsletter is going to be affiliate linked to a fellow networked uh, promoter um, of, of something similar in the alt health sphere. And sometimes those affiliate deals are worth a lot of money. Uh, as in, you know, if somebody's selling a workshop for $700 that is promoting vaginal kung fu or something like that, if they sign, <laughs> if they sign up to that thing through Kelly Brogan's email list, Kelly Brogan might get 50% of that fee, right? Uh, and so we're not we're talking we're talking about a lot of business dollars floating around uh, in, a, in an industry that seems to be hyper individualistic, but it's actually quite synergistic in terms of its capitalism. It's just making me think about, you know, how vapid to to a significant degree the the defense of guilt by association is as a as a like kind yes. of get out right. of jail uh three card right because people use it to say well you're not dealing with the arguments you're just noticing that they're talking to these people and and it is true that you know you can you can appear with someone without endorsing them you could you could have a critical interview so on like appearances do not entail that people endorse all of the agenda of the people they appear with however people who appear together regularly talk about the same things frequently and right when you look at their networks and they're you know there's a very distinct political flavor or a very distinct ideological pattern it is informative but it's uh even i and the elements that you're talking about here with you know cross promotions and uh like actual profit right that, that, that selling goods and services and workshops it's it's incredibly telling to to follow networks and to look at those kind of connections and to right. not do so is actually kind of missing the bigger picture in some respects. So, yeah, it just, yeah. Well, well I mean, the, the thing that really made Matthew's point super clear to me was in doing a bit of background research on the JP Sears episode um, led me to um, the Lon London Reel and um, right. his... And his, um, there were, he had an extended interview with the fellow who runs that. His name was um, Brian uh, Rose. Rose. That, oh, Brian that's Rose. it, Rose. That's <laughs> it, Rose. And just the nature of their discussion. I mean, they spent 40, uh, you know, the, the, the vast majority of their time talking about like business. Like it, right. it was that they were talking about an alliance of their business interests and how great it was to be an entrepreneur and to take those, um, you know, there was, there was a bit of reference to sort of spiritual or kind of new age <laughs> principles, but they very and quickly Braveheart. went, yeah, and Braveheart, <laughs> um, <laughs> and very, but it very quickly came back to how that would be used to, in order to, you know, build, I forget the, the, the buzz phrases they were using, but it was always stuff like, yeah, I think it, they were using the word empire. It was actually using the word, I'm going to build my online empire. And that stuck out to me going, is that, that's just. Yeah, you, because you know, when you were talking to me about that, you were strongly emphasizing, but these guys are just like, they're just capitalists. <laughs> like like they're, they, they're, they were saying, it felt like they were saying the quiet bit very loud. <laughs> like, um, anyway, I don't know. Yeah I, yeah, I don't think it is a quiet bit, but there's also something so kind of uh, deceptive about this collapse of categories. So. So um, JP Sears is interviewing Brian Rose or mm. they're talking and we're eavesdropping about their business prowess. And who's the audience? Is it, is it, 
Is it bros? Is it bros who want to, you know, up their own game in the tech sphere? Is it so? There's so there's this mixture of anti-authoritarianism while we're building a dominant empire, while we're giving life coaching about how successful we can be when we commit to our principles. It's like, what the fuck is that? Like, what is that? That's mm. it's not. We're we're it's it. And this is why this is why I wanted to I wanted to say that if you want an addition to the gurometer, mm. it seems like there is a lot now, you know, present company aside, there is a lot of this stuff that's built on men talking to each other. And we've you sort of referenced it, Matt, a little bit uh, with with, you know, you know, the, the, the big egos kind of both massaging, but also creating friction between each other. Uh, but this is going to be the MHU. <laughs> there we, there we, there we, <laughs> yes, there, there, there we go. But, but, uh, but uh, I, I mean, the, the, so often it seems that we're talking about uh, men who have gathered social power uh, who are being eavesdropped upon, right? And who are being, they're, they're allowing their audience into a kind of locker room uh that is hyper intelligent it might not be so smelly it might be like it might smell like tea right it might it might uh it's like a an enlightened locker room um and so and so yeah i just wanted that was the main thing that i wanted to sort of throw onto the garometer list is is uh grandiose i don't want to necessarily i mean toxic masculinity comes with a lot of pre-definitions but and it and some of it is toxic, but it's also grandiose uh, masculinity. I'll, look, look uh, Matthew, I'll, I'll let Chris answer because we are very much on the same page. We talked about right. this a lot. Uh, right, and, uh, right. Yeah, Chris. Right. Yeah, that. I mean, it, it just the what you're describing sounds so familiar because we recently, like, I don't know how long it is. They're all seared into my mind and like, a, <laughs> you know, time is a flat circle with the gurus, but the. <laughs> um, that we listened to four hours of Eric and Douglas Murray. Uh, having, oh yes, uh, I saw. I I I listened. I listened. I listened to about half of your review of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, and that took us like weeks to get through, even though we, we like because of how long it was. But it, it, that that feature that you're talking about, like who's this for, and, and what is this? Because this sounds like two guys sitting talking in large part talking about you know how insightful they are and how the friends are important and the things that they do which are interesting and and you know touch a little bit on political topics and uh contemporary issues but it it felt like an interminable like like being trapped in their dinner conversation and being unable to exit it but i i got the feeling and you pointed this out, Matt, at the time that the way it's framed and the way that I see people online in forums responding to that is as if so some people notice the indulgent nature of it. It is true. It's not like there's no critical consumers, but there's another group of people who respond as if they've been let into an exclusive club and that they're they're being allowed to see this world of intellectuals and academics and the kind of you know, the thinkers in society, the people who can really think. And and Eric and Douglas completely lean into that. And so do many of the gurus that we are looking at, that, that that's what they want to do. They want to bring in their followers, let them into these spaces, which, you know, normally the academics and elites will keep them out of. That's their, yeah. their framing. I, I, I want to say something that feels a little bit sad, which is that um, I think the the bro influencer vibe that is so attractive uh, is is really it's really a serving a need for friendship and for uh, dialogue and for transparency, especially between men uh, that it won't that it that it that it can't actually do. Uh, there was one there was one bonus episode that I produced uh, for the podcast called. Uh, um, something like uh, solstice light in the man cave or something like that. And I was talking about the vocal um, affect of the people, the men, especially that, that, that we study. But the last thing that I clipped was um, a quote unquote interview, really kind of overheard conversation between JP Sears and his buddy, Tim Kennedy, 
uh, who's an ex MMA fighter oh, right. and, uh, and, and an ex um, army ranger, I think, who also revealed that he was one of the, um, I think, unmarked or unbadged federal agents who was roaming through Portland this summer, uh, throwing people into tactical minivans. Uh, so, you know, like there's a real intersection between between JP's tip and, uh, you know, hard, hard right and authoritarian uh, governance politics in in mm. the states. But this dialogue that they have is like totally it's 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 there's there's an alpha beta thing going on where jp sears is like groveling in front of in front of his you know muscle master uh, tim kennedy but also there's this like this kind of um facade of intimacy and i don't know it's like when you see when you see guys like not in the locker room who are not really able to make eye contact but they kind of like greet each other with a chest bump while looking away it's kind of that feeling where mm. where uh there's there's this <laughs> <laughs> there's this sense that there's this there's this sense that that there's there's a possible closeness and a s sense of shared values but really what is shared between them is their social power right because if, if one of them was not earning as much, if one of them was a loser or a nerd or a or a you know or was homosexual or something like that, that they they wouldn't be doing that chest bump. And so there's there's all of this social coding that's going on in these in these conversations that I think along with the performance aspect, how the influencers actually give their stuff, I think it confounds this basic approach that a lot of us have, which is let's let's make them get their facts right uh, because you know it's not like i don't think i don't think it's about i don't think it's about the the facts and the data and the and the and the bad arguments it's about how are the bros relating to the bro influencer vibe and how good does that feel and what is it replacing i, I might do on this I, I have something to say but i'll you no, I just I just really like what Matthew said. <laughs> I mean, I mean I just, like I, 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 I mean it's it's so much in along the same lines that we've been talking about, which is that the form is really important and totally and you, and you can't just focus on the content. And and we were talking about that parasocial stuff where we we could see how there was that sort of intimate feeling that you were a part of this conversation and you talked about that kind of that relationship i mean um eric was groveling somewhat in that yeah, to <laughs> in that to, to, to douglas um but they absolutely would not be doing that or saying those things unless they recognized some mutually advantageous power thing going on yeah. and 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 i just think it's so true um that when and then when, when i think of the people um, and by the way, Matthew, the, the, the people who are fans of the figures we criticize, um, are, we often know them on Twitter and other, in other places and they engage with us and they've been very cool about it, actually. Like we yeah. haven't copped a great deal of flack, um, but obviously many of them are not super happy with our criticisms. And so it's, right. been, it's been interesting to pay attention to their responses. And I, I mean... I don't. I don't think I'm being too unfair when I say that. I, I think. I think a lot of them just. They say we're being unfair to their arguments or aren't dealing properly with their arguments. But I, I just. I get the sense that they. They. They just. They just like the feeling. It's. It's. It's the feeling in the form. Yeah. They love them. Mm. Like I. I don't know. I don't know if you heard. I. I've probably told this story on the podcast maybe twice. But I went to see Jordan Peterson in person. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, and it, that was really interesting. But right. Well, he. He. I mean. I. I. Like. All of all of my red flags went off, uh, went up and started waving around because literally the feeling in the room with probably five or six hundred people attending, it was packed. It was a lecture hall. We all paid thirty five dollars to be there for a two and a half hour lecture where he didn't get to the bloody content until the last 15 minutes. And that was terrible. Uh, so he just did his buzzwords and his like, you know, uh, feminists are ruining everything stuff. Uh, and and but the feeling of him walking out onto the 
stage. The only thing that came close to it was when I was in a, was, I went to a concert like in the early 90s in a stadium uh, with U2 and Bono coming onto the stage in the midst of his light show. That was like that, right? Like there was this buildup. People were stamping their feet on the floor uh, for him to come into the room. And then he sort of bounces in in his, you know, in his kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, th- you know, three piece suit and his watch chain and stuff like that, kind of steampunky, and uh, and people stand up and roar, right? And like that is not you're not going to have an argument about about whether cultural Marxism is a thing with people like that because cultural Marxism is literally like. It's just the word that that goes into their mouth like or their ear like some sort of drug and sets off this physiological response, which is I belong to something and, you know, I'm going to, you know, defend something and I'm going to, you know, stand up for something and I'm going to feel noble about something. It's never quite defined. Uh, And so, yeah, uh, I I think the feeling of the thing is so incredibly important. Um, Mm There's a you know that so you mentioned as well, Matthew, that the uh, there's an element of a kind of men's club, right? W- yeah. Within within the guru sphere, which is evident in the people that we've covered, and I think we've discussed, uh, Matt, that we thought maybe the uh, health and wellness and alternative spirituality spheres might have more space for uh, women, which I, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on. But but before that, the one thing that definitely struck me was, so uh, I, I think it's been, a lot of people have commented about, you know, long form audio or podcast format uh, has the ability to create an intimacy with yeah. be- between listener and uh, host and, and I felt that a long, long time ago when I was listening to the Skeptics Guide to the Universe, you know, had been passively consuming it as content. And then one of the hosts died. And the reaction for me felt like somebody, you know, like somebody I had known had died. And of course, I'd never met them, had no interaction with them. But it it, it hit me like hard yeah. when I heard the announcement. And I, the thing that surprised me at that time was that I hadn't realized I had developed, you know, a kind of uh, a feeling of a one, one completely one sided, uh, yeah. like feeling of intimacy or friendship with this with this host. And I'm sure, you know, who would have been a lovely guy if you'd met him in person or just a normal person. But it definitely made clear to me. And this was uh, like in the early era of podcasting that that intimacy was possible. Um, and so. I, I think the critique, you were kindly, you know, you kindly said, you know, present company excluded, but I also think <laughs> we, and I don't think you would have any issue admitting this, that we don't get out of that dynamic. That not at all. Not the, at all. No. When even I would say, Matt, like you and I have never met in person, right? We, we met in a very digital, you know, 2020 kind of way through Twitter and then the over Skype and Zoom and then created a podcast together. But I would still say that, you know, I would consider you a friend and like, I wouldn't expect that if I met you in person, that things would be very different. And the so the the feels to me that there's an element where these podcast spaces and the ability for people to focus on niche topics and form communities like Patreons or that kind of thing around areas of interest in it's a complete, in some sense, it's like a neutral space, right? Or it could be used for creating communities that allow people to meet people that they wouldn't meet to form like interest groups where they they wouldn't be able to form it in their own communities and potentially to reach more diverse people. Um, but it also carries with it because of the intimacy aspect and because of the the ability for these all these kind of dynamics that you have been touching on with the presentation and with the ASMR and with the kind of one way nature of the relationships that it's it it just it, it ends up bringing back to me this distinction that the philosopher T kept making that there's 
the thing which is real that you get a genuine feeling of connection or you get a genuine feeling of an insight from you know from actually having insight and actually having friendship and yeah. there's and then there's another thing which is parasitic on that which is uh, looks very similar to it invites the same feelings but is ultimately empty and distinguishing between those two things is very hard because the feeling in both cases is real and, and isn't it, that why and isn't that why listening to brett and eric weinstein talk on the same podcast is so excruciating because those two things are actually blended they're they're they are brothers they obviously grew up in a very complex uh you know sort of network uh, and so they have legitimate intimacy and they are also like absolutely performing their, yes. their social yeah. roles and their, and their, and their, and their professionalism. And so, yeah. And that's another thing about influencer culture in general, though, is that, is that it, it, it really breaks down these categories between, uh, between personal and professional, uh, and between, and between private and public in very, very disarming and, uh, and, and disturbing and disturbing ways. Um, but to speak to your question about like, okay, well, uh, so many of our subjects are, are, are men. And I think as, as you know, in our group, we understand those dynamics probably from early childhood and we have some sense of what that, what that all feels like. Um, but in yoga and wellness, you know, we are talking about we are talking about a, a practice and a consumer population that's probably seventy or eighty percent women. And I do want to say that, like, leadership and charismatic leadership amongst women influencers is just as big. Uh, but it follows, as far as I can tell, many of the same sort of dominance principles that we see in in the in the bro sphere. Um, but I don't spend. I mean, I've done I've done journalism on on somebody on people like Kelly Brogan, uh, but I don't spend a lot of time uh, critiquing that because I really believe that you know legitimate feminist scholars should be doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I it's very I think it's very difficult to do that without without uh, you know appearing to be insensitive or misogynistic or sort of like ignorant about about uh, you know structural misogyny. Uh, but I, I will say that a lot of the women influencers that we look at on the podcast, so, um, you know, Brogan, Christiane Northrup, uh, um, Bauhaus wife, Yulan Norris Clark of the Free Birth Society, um, a, a lot of them present this kind of like uh, faux feminism that's either pushing a really like super conservative goddess type idealization of women's power that is centered in reproduction or they are often deferring to male charismatics in their field. So, you know, Christiane Northrup will be constantly talking about how handsome and wise Zach Bush is, uh, or, you know, she'll have Andrew Wakefield on <laughs> to talk about how he's an, some sort of ultimate protector of women because he found out that vaccines were causing autism and he was the first one to start listening to women. So there's this weird kind of patriarchal deference that we see play out in, uh, I would say, in, in, in women's wellness spaces as well. But I think I've said enough. <laughs> uh, I, the, there's a whole bunch more that I would be really, yeah. uh, I, I want to ask you, but I'm, I'm also aware that I've eaten up a whole bunch of your time and that I'm probably uh dragging Matt closer to the grave with, oh right every yes. pass, you know. but he's, he's he's woken up it's I'm, it's, I'm, it's I'm, good I'm, yeah yeah I'm here. but so maybe do you have time just for one more uh set of questions and then we can uh yes. I'll let you escape but it, it, sure, it's been a, sure. a pleasure Matthew and uh, like I I hope we can continue having uh like these kind of discussions because it's I think the there's a lot of overlap and there's the it, it's very interesting to look at the the points where the these kind of areas you know when you look at our podcast art for example there's a, yeah. there's already a quite a great deal of overlap uh right, there. but right. I, I think i think in the dynamics and the uh the figures even the figures are starting to overlap but any case in any case um the the last thing i wanted to ask you about um 
you because we we've, we've kind of touched on things that we are missing with the grometer from our analysis and so on is that the so you i think it's fair to say that you and also us are in walking the line between uh documenting a phenomenon and kind of you know offering commentary and in some sense coming close to activism maybe me and matt less so because we're uh like not serious enough to be doing it genuinely but i but i also feel that we do both have the view that we are providing a kind of inoculation for people and a set of tools with which yes we're poking fun and you know having having fun with the content that we look at but we we do try to highlight the techniques and the tactics that are in use and i i wonder though this this balance between you know when you're studying a phenomenon and you're critical of it um and that you think it does real harm that how you can retain a a kind of objective researcher bias where it doesn't become that you're just you know uh i'm not sure me and matt always do this but like where, you know that you're not just tearing the people down uh or that you're not you know unfairly representing them because you you disagree with them so that balance i'm just wondering if you have any reflections on it uh, from your own work yeah totally i mean um i i think the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't finish college because I my life went sideways, and then I was in in cults for six years. But when I was in college, um, you know, what really struck home for me was the sort of you know more almost spiritual teachings of of uh, postmodern literary criticism and uh, how it investigated language and meaning and. Um, uh, and how it really sort of cast a lifelong doubt upon the process of or the premise of objectivity uh, that, you know, you can try, but you have to be really clear about your positionality and you have to know what you don't know and you have to, you know, be clear about what your boundaries are. And so, you know, I don't have a pretense to objectivity and because I'm not an academic, I don't really have to. I don't have to maintain one, uh, and and I don't like. I think that I think that you both in your publication careers, I imagine you would, you know, you would you would uh, you would start to close off some avenues if you if you pushed uh, farther into the activism line, um, mm. but maybe that depends upon like you know how you're hired right now and whether you're looking for work or or whatever. Uh, Matt's much safer than I am. That's the uh, yeah. We <laughs> see. You, yeah, you see, I mean, that's the thing is that is that we we have, uh, you know, that, that it's a question of it's a question of like how how well supported I think we are by institutions and by and by the media platforms that we use. Uh, I'm, you know, my my experience for six years in two different cults is like a defining feature of my life, and I can't really undo that or unsee that or like not come from the perspective of I don't want people to be unduly influenced by charismatic people ever like I just don't want that to happen it's like having a an instinct against bullies uh, mm -hmm. and and so and so I'm never going to get rid of that um, but what I do want to have more of is the kind of like editorial and fact-checking oversight that I get when I move more into journalism with, you know, publications like The Walrus or, or Jen at Medium, where, you know, somebody is going to vet every sentence that I write and say, give me two sources for this. Uh, and, you know, uh, and then a lawyer is going to go through everything and they're going to hedge and they're going to say, okay, do we really want, do we really need to go that far? Uh, or can't we just let this speak for itself? And that process has been really, um, I think it's been really good for my my work, but I think also it's been really good for my my just my personal life in the sense that it's made me a lot clearer about the difference between a, why I'm personally motivated to do something and whether or not I'm being of service or whether or not I'm, 
you know, uh, just kind of feeding my own needs or which is very easy to do in this in this environment yeah. of of, um, you know, self-employed content production. Right. So. So, um, yeah, I I don't think I don't think I. Uh, I, I don't think I can be objective, but I think I can test myself against, you know, principles of neutrality or fairness, uh, and and invite that, and 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 then and then just go from there. Mm, that's great. Yeah, like you know, one thing that strikes me is that the people who uh, are concerned and have you know self awareness and 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 degrees of doubt about their motivations and how pure they are and so on yeah they, they're not the gurus so if you have those right. you're you're probably uh you know you're doing okay um <laughs> so the but uh, um but i i i also realized that you know good interviewer technique probably doesn't end on a negative question <laughs> right right, to, right. To, so so on that um learning as we go along uh, so of course you have the conspirituality podcast, which I I heartily recommend. And we haven't we haven't really spent time getting into your personal experiences with cults, which is somewhat amazing. But again, illustrating our brilliance as interviewers. But the um, so I'm sure we'll have conversations uh, in the future. But uh, so are there any other upcoming projects or uh, areas where people can find your work that you'd uh, want to highlight or mention? Uh, yeah, um, I am going to, I think I just uh, finished the contract with uh, one section of the Medium platform where uh, I've been given like space for 12 columns, uh, four per month starting on March First, and I'm going to try to put together a kind of summary series called the Conspirituality Fieldbook or something like that. Uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to that opportunity. Um, we're very, yeah, thank you for your, your kind words. Uh, your, your, your own podcast has been really helpful for me personally. And yeah, the podcast is really fulfilling to work on. We have to you know, continue to broaden our horizons, I think, and, um, you know, figure out how to not bite off more than we can chew and, and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, I would like to put together the last year and a half or so of reflections on conspirituality into some sort of larger book. So, so I'll see if I can see if I can pull that off amidst, um, you know, homeschooling and, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and, and, and related chaos here. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, well, the, not, not quite this, sure. Not quite sure what it, what the future holds. Yeah. Uh, that, that it, it sounds like good things, but, the this, this has been really fascinating. I could continue talking endlessly as Matt could attest, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. but I, I really appreciate all the time you've spent uh and and the insights you've offered and uh yeah the next episode that will come out after this following on your advice Matthew about uh you know dealing with people that you're well qualified so we're going to cover Abram X Candy who's, oh my gosh uh, oh that'll be fascinating yeah, that, that's so. This is possibly our last episode before we are ceremoniously uh, kicked off. But yeah, that that will be a change of pace as the right. the kind of proper left wing people tend to be. Um, so yeah, right. you, but but yeah, look um, for, from me too, Matthew. Um, thanks so much for um, talking with us. Um, uh, to to our listeners, absolutely. The um, conspirituality podcast is uh, is required reading. It is prescribed texts because you know really that that original generation um, cons you know guru like behavior was really the inspiration for us to look at this these newfangled gurus who who, who are a weird new thing. But uh, you know I don't think you can really understand what's going on with these people without understanding. The, the 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 gurus in the spirituality health and wellness 
space. So um, it's not only a great podcast, but it also covers um, um, essential material. So we'll post links to um, all kinds of ways in which you can um, um, l l link up with um, Matthew and um, another related materials. And uh, yeah, just thanks again. Thank you so yeah. much, both of you. Thanks. You've also added a new sign off for me. I think my, I'm going to finish ep every episode by saying that you need to grovel at the feet of your muscle master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, 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 <laughs> that. That'll be better than bye bye, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that sounds, that's not creepy at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Matthew. Right. Thanks, thank you. Bye bye. Mate. Yeah.